Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We had a document called the CAP or the CMMC assessment process get released publicly about two weeks ago. So I wanted to walk through this with some stakeholders that we have on a Discord group called CUI. So my name is Joy Beeland, and we're going to go ahead and introduce some of our guests today who are stakeholders in um, what this document is and what it will mean for the CMMC assessment process. I have with me Allison, Terry, Amira, and I wanted to start with Amira, um, sorry, with Allison, if you could introduce yourself and tell us also uh, not just about your organization, but what your organization's role is in the CMMC ecosystem. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. My name is Allison Giddens. I am president of Wooden Tech, an aerospace machine shop uh, outside of Atlanta. Uh, we manufacture a lot of parts for defense industry base. And um, our role is we're an organization seeking certification. We're a small business and uh, working with an MSP. So it's there's there are a lot of uh, different things at play for us. Okay. And because of the criticality of the data that your organization handles, your organization would seek a level two certification? Correct. Likely, likely. Mm -hmm. Likely, okay, super. Terry, welcome. Hey, hi, Joy. Uh, Terry Aber, Centurum Incorporated, uh, small defense uh, uh, industry, about two, uh, 250 employees. Um, I've been involved with uh, 874 d 12 rule for, for probably about 10 years now from when it first started uh, internally. A big part of the DIB CS program, I uh, lead the SMB working group and also coolly with Allison and, and the ISAC working group. Okay. You used a couple acronyms there for those who don't know the DIB CS program. Yeah, the cybersecurity program, it was actually uh, implemented for a collaboration between the Department of Defense and industry. So they have nice. been holding uh, working group meetings and uh, providing industry a lot of tools and uh, conversations to help uh, along in preparations uh, for 800 Okay, great. And where are you based out of? I'm in Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach. Welcome. Nice to have you, Terry. Thank you. Amira. Hi, I'm Amira Armand. I'm the president of Curie Solutions, which is a uh, CMMC third-party assessment organization. And um, I personally, I'm a, I'm a cybersecurity uh, person. I'm a systems architect. I have uh, uh, been granted provisional assessor and provisional instructor uh, roles for CMMC. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the C3PAO Stakeholder Forum, which is an industry group of um, more than uh, 200 C3PO representatives that are working to achieve consistency of assessment. Fantastic. C3PAO, a certified or a CMMC third party assessment organization. So many acronyms in this ecosystem, in any yeah, type of security. Um, and it, it could be certified third party assessment organization. There's been a bit of a name change um, recently. Okay. Um, nice to have you, Amira. And Amira and I have worked together for a couple of years now. Um, and um, have delivered some of the certified CMMC professional training, um, CCP. Uh, my name is Joy Beeling from Summit 7, and we are an MSP based in Huntsville, Alabama. And all of our clients are in the defense industrial base. So that's all we do, you know, is, is um, help to prepare them, walk them through, and then ongoing maintenance and support for the CMMC program. And um, as such, I'm a provisional assessor and provisional instructor. And so um, we're going to go ahead and start with a little bit of information about the CAP itself. Um, we're going to talk about the Discord group, and Allison's going to give us some background on how it formed, what the purpose is, um, talk about the CAP, the CMMC AB, or the CMMC assessment process. That's what CAP stands for, what that document is and um, why it's important, right? Um, some overall concerns, some phase by phase concerns, and then we're gonna wrap it up with our recommendation because there's a public comment period. And that's the whole reason that we're doing this um, conversation is to talk through what we see or have identified as some important things that we want people to voice. 
So Allison, give us some background on the Discord group called CUI, Center of Excellence, and, and how long they've been around, um, you know, who they're made up of. What do you know about it? Sure. So a few years ago, uh, there was a core group of people. Um, unfortunately, I was not I was not one of them. I, I didn't know they existed at the time, but a, a few people came together and said, you know, there's the CMMC thing floating around. We need to get together and maybe share some resources. So it started off as a, a much smaller group um, and it has since expanded greatly. Um, I, I guess we're almost at 2000 members, uh, kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, but we always hit just under 2000 active members. Um, we have everyone from MSPs to OSCs to, to um, P, uh, PAs, LPPs, you, you name it, all the acronyms that have just been thrown out uh, before and after. Um, and there are also uh, a handful of our government friends are also in there, which is kind of cool because you know that they can listen. Sometimes they, well, like they can't frequently offer advice or insight into things, obviously, but it helps to know that um, you're, you are with a bunch of people with a single purpose, and that is all communicating resources. Thanks for that. Love that background. Um, we'll go ahead and move into what is the CAP. Um, first of all, it was released publicly, and then apparently there was a problem with the website where the navigation to that document was broken. We were able to do a Google search and we still could find it on the cyberab.org website. So I have a little bit of a long convoluted URL in here for those who haven't been able to download it, to look at it before. Um, but what this document is, is it really is an assessment process guideline that's to be used by all of the third party assessors um, in conducting a formal assessment of an organization that needs to be assessed at level two for CMMC. Um, it has the inclusion of many templates, but those templates right now are um, on a, 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 what do we want to call it, a, a login. It's required for a login um, and a gated, thank you, a gated website um, for the AB. And no one actually has access to that other than maybe some of the C3PAOs that are out there in the pilot program doing some assessments. So those templates and additional forms that are linked throughout the assessor guide need to be released to the public so everyone can see what it is that they have. Um, it designates role assignments. It gives criteria for scoring throughout the conducting of the assessment. It has required outputs, deliverables, reports, whatever you want to call them throughout different phases of that process. And then it has criteria for uh, potential flexibility and what we call a POAM or a plan of action and milestones should an organization not 100% meet the qualifications for an immediate certification at the end of that assessment. So that's the quick lowdown on what it is. Uh, the reason it's so important is that there are three total documents that would be used by an assessment team um, in going out there to establish whether or not an organization has met the criteria. So we have the assessment scope guide for level two, we have the assessment guide itself at level two, and then we have the assessment process. And the combination of these three things are the authoritative documents that an organization that's going to be assessed can expect to know what is going to happen when a assessor team comes through the door. Everyone should be on the same page in the ecosystem, whether you're a consultant, an assessor, or an organization that's being assessed, simply by referencing what's in these three documents. We all agree on that? Okay, awesome. So it's broken into four phases. I'm not gonna go through all four phases except for at a very high level. Phase one is in the readiness phase. Phase two is when you're conducting the formal assessment. Phase three is when you're delivering those recommended assessment results. And if the uh, company qualifies, the organization qualifies, there would be a phase four where any of those items that were placed on the plan of action and milestones would be closed out. So at a very high level, that's what the process would be. We're gonna go ahead and move into uh, the reason for us being here today is that this fabulous group, the CUI group on Discord, took the time to go through this document that um, it took a lot of time. I think there was more than 80 man hours put into it. 
I, I, of the four of us, I actually participated the least because of scheduling restrictions. But you three, I know, along with a whole bunch of other people, were rock stars in dedicating your own personal time to going through it line by line and trying to draft, um, let's call it a open letter to the AB is what was generated from this. Um, and Allison, if you'll give your, your wording on how um, you wanted that to be presented out there in the community. Because I know there was some um, controversy you wanted to avoid in it. So what was the goal of the paper? Well, right off the bat, when the draft was released, I believe it was July 26th, right off the bat, it seemed like there were a lot of common themes that people agreed needed to change. And so there was a core group of us that said, if there are key things that are no brainers to 99% of the industry, whether you're on the assessor side or the being assessed side, um, then that's a no brainer. Then we need to get those fixed. And so we said, well, if we can come up with some key themes and put them in a basic letter, a basic open letter, then we can get a lot of people and companies to agree to put their names on it as an open letter, just to show show that commonality and to show that agreement of, hey, look, here's the lowest hanging fruit. Here is the stuff that would make sense for industry and it would not defeat the purpose of the intent of the assessment. So we um, we ended up finding a, a bunch of themes and I know we're gonna cover a, a handful today, um, but we found a bunch of themes and well over 30 people and companies agreed to put their name on it. and. It was funny because it wasn't only it was the next day that I was getting pinged from people saying, um, oh, I finally got approval for it. Would you put my name? So we kept having add ons. Oh, um, but it was a really great process because Amira can speak more to this. The, she came up with a way where we would go section by section very methodically in these conversations, because on the evening of July 26th, when we all thought, oh, let's, you know, have some conversations. There were some naysayers out there. There were people like this is going to be a circus, you can't have conversations with a bunch of stakeholders in a room about, everybody's gonna disagree. But Amira had a great process where we go section by section and, and level set, ask a few questions to kind of get everybody either on the same page or recognize that there were gonna be some discrepancies. And then we could dive into recommended proposals and some feedback and we documented everything so that even though there was an open letter that the majority of people signed on to there was another document that we processed that kept up with everybody's feedback and proposals so that people could go back and say you know what i know that i wasn't in the majority for this but i really like this idea and they can take that back to the ab and propose it excellent and i saw in that process that you used the uh there was a line by line tracking of what people were proposing and then a vote on it or whether or not it made sense to the people participating that that should be included in this paper. So I really love the way that it was done at number one through the detail and number two in such a democratic way, right? With people. Yeah, it, was, it was kind of cool to watch because, you know, I was, as a they would go through the conversations mm -hmm. and they would post the questions, people started voting on something. And then new concepts, new ideas were proposed, a different point of view perspective. And you'd watch the votes change, right? You could see they were they're acknowledging, okay, well, maybe maybe I didn't think through this completely, and that was really neat and cool to kind of see because it becomes really collaborative that that at that point in time, we all start learning, assumptions start dropping, um, and it was really it was a great process. It was really cool. One thing uh, also to mention was that you know even though people signed that letter and. Uh, it didn't mean that everybody approved with or agreed with all of the statements, you know, so that's, that's we're probably really, uh, we need to make sure that it's, uh, well, uh, shared. Agreed. Um, Amira, talk us through some of what we're looking at on the screen here, because at the outset, I think that there were some big overall things that became clear. Right. So let me, let me pull this way up to what the CMMC assessment process is supposed to do. Because we, and this is something that I, I, I gave a, a short talk to the, the, the participants in the review meetings each session um, to level set. You showed a slide earlier that had 
the CMMC assessment guide, the CMMC scoping guide, and then the CMMC assessment process. Right now, two of those documents are published by the Department of Defense, the assessment guide and the scoping guide. Right, those are the technical. How do you um, evaluate the environment? Right, how do you determine uh, whether a implementation is correct or not for cybersecurity? The assessment process is not meant to be a technical guide. It's not meant to set requirements. It is supposed to tell assessors how to do a consistent assessment, right? So that when you have uh, 500 assessment teams with different people going to different companies, we get the same result from each assessment, right? We get a predictable result. Um, the key areas that any assessment process are supposed to address uh, is the intake process, right? Do you, do you allow companies to come in with known flaws or do you, do you make sure that they are at a certain level of readiness first? Um, how many assessors you're supposed to have involved for a certain level of complexity, right? That's a, that's a big thing because uh, the more investigation you do, the more problems you find, right? We, we, we may have seen, there's a funny, um, there's a funny video of somebody who's screening a crowd before they enter uh, a building. And, uh, you know, the first person he pats down and then the se second person, his hands get a little bit further. And then the third, third person, he's not even touching them. Right. Um, and guess, guess which level of detail and scrutiny is going to find a problem, right? You actually have to look hard to find problems. Uh, and assessment processes are supposed to tell assessors how hard to look. Do they spend 10 minutes per requirement or do they spend one minute per requirement? Um, and assessment processes are also supposed to tell you uh, whether you're allowed to fix issues in the middle of the assessment and some other details, right? Mm -hmm. Standardization. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not meant to add requirements. They're not, they're not meant to replace the DOD's technical requirements that are already uh, stated in the assessment guide and the scoping guide. Um, so back to your, your original ask, Joy. Uh, some of the first things that we saw was that in the uh, assessment process, there was there's a lot of language in there, um, which quite a bit more. There's something like 50 pages of text uh, in the in the version one that was released, um, which is a lot more than the equivalent FedRAMP assessment process, for example. Uh, and it had quite a few shoulds, right? So um, the 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 assessment team lead should do this, you know, this person should do that. That's a very dangerous thing when we're talking about consistency of assessment, because um, that's not a requirement, right? If we want assessments to be consistent, then either everybody does it or nobody does it. Uh, so we, we do recommend taking all of those out unless they're actually required. Um, and then we had a lot of conversation where the CMOC assessment process was telling C3 PIOs, the assessment teams and the OSC what they had to do in regard to reviewing evidence, right? You're, you're allowed to uh, send evidence to the C3PAO under this condition, but then the C3PAO has to delete it immediately and they have to sign, sign stuff, you know, or in other cases, you're not allowed to send data to the C3PAO, right? And now the C3PAOs and the assessment teams go, how are we supposed to assess when it's this strict? Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about it should be governed by an agreement, the, the OSC and the C3PIO need to determine whether they trust each other. And if the OSC trusts the C3PIO to give them their evidence in order to do an assessment, that should be allowed uh, as opposed to adding uh, requirements throughout an entire timeline that say you're allowed to have it in this condition, but not here. And you might have to go on site to do a pre-review. It, it gets a little bit extreme.
And, you know, and, and one it. of the reasons that's so relevant is that every C3 PAO that might be out there doing a formal assessment has gone through an assessment themselves by an organization called DIPCAC, right? The D Defense Industrial Bay Cybersecurity Assessment Center, mm -hmm. where they've had their own environment scrutinized according to the same level of cybersecurity protection, the full 110 controls, 320 assessment objectives. So they've had to prove that they would um, have the capabilities, the skill set, and cybersecurity technology, people process technology, all of that, in order to handle sensitive data um, at a level that they actually legally aren't bound to have to do, but they have done that. Right. They've gone through. They don't have controlled unclassified information at the C3PAO level, but they had to prove that they could handle it. Right. Or organizations like mine, we went through the first CMMC assessments. We we got to have the the client experience, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that people like uh, WinTech, uh, they're getting ready to have. Um, and I and I can tell you the very first thing that happened when we got assessed by the government was they said, send us all your information um right and then the cmmc assessment process says something else uh and mm -hmm. and from a assessor perspective uh at the very very least there's a real concern about appeals and complaints um you know and being able to justify the assessment results at the end of the assessment and uh other other assessment um schemes such as SOC, uh, you know, or, or ISO 17,000, uh, um, they all expect the assessors to keep some level of evidence long term in case there's a disagreement. Uh, so that's a, that is a major concern about liability for the C3PIO being able to prove that they did a good job. And, I, and you I, know, I there's... Oh, go ahead. Good. Uh, no, there's a there's a huge parallel I keep coming back to because I, I know we all like to fall into our own mental models. And I keep coming back to ISO 9001 or AS9100, which if you're in the DIB, likely you are ISO or AS certified for your quality management system. And the way that we work with assessors and auditors is drastically different than what this plan is proposing. There are levels of as Mira stated, of, of keeping evidence long-term. Um, there's an appeals process. That word should is a scary, scary thing because already as, as a company getting assessed for a quality management system, we will regularly have debates with our auditors on the word shall. So, it, you know, if, if we're already struggling, not struggling, but if we're already finding debate with the word shall, I can only imagine what kind of rabbit hole should will propose. <laughs> Terry, how do you feel? Yeah, you know, I, I suspect if Cyber AB had good good intentions in regards to putting stuff in here. Yeah. I think the problem is though, it, it actually can hamper and even be more cost prohibitive for an organization if they don't allow the organization to make the contractual requirements with the C3PO directly. So, for example, if if I'm an organization, I'm looking to be assessed, I want to try to minimize the cost and how quickly we can do the assessment. So if I can give them information that can speed up the process, give them confidence that I'm ready for the assessment, then allow me to do that. Make let, Allow the organization to make that risk-based decision whether they hold their data or not. And even if I get assessed again three years later, if I allow them to say, hey, you are allowed to actually keep this information, maybe it's in some kind of GRC platform or something where I can update it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. It's a continuous kind of a monitoring pr perspective. Then there's mm -hmm. even the possibility of reducing it even further for reassessments later on because that information is continuously being updated. But if, if you don't, if they try to... Uh, mandate how the risk for the organization seeking certification is managed, then that's going to increase our cost. Yeah, and, and the cost of the defense industrial base is already exorbitant, and there's been so much 
um, said out there about it for the small organizations, especially. And we're not talking about the huge primes. We're talking about the sub of the sub of the sub. Um, very small companies that are um, being asked to, um, you know, align with this. Which brings me to the next point, and this one has been one that has been harder to avoid controversy. Um, first of all, there's a new, um, the term external cloud service providers is not new. What happened in this though, and this is in the first phase, um, I believe it's 1.5.4, um, what they did is they used this term and then they bundled in new entities. So they kind of created a hybrid of um, different types of service providers. And we have a lot of acronyms on the screen, but what this means is cloud service providers, managed service providers, managed security service providers, and external service providers. Now, important to note, MSPs fall under a category of ESPs, a managed service provider. And what that function is, is generally outsourced IT. And tons of organizations in the defense industrial base are small enough that they can't afford their own full-time IT support. So what they do is they outsource that for a firm that will come in and help to do things, everything from standing up their servers, um, you know, readying their cloud repositories for where they're going to save their data, um, deploy new desktops, uh, vulnerability patching, you know, keeping everything updated for Windows updates and every other kind of update, install new software, all the things that an IT person would normally do if they worked internal to an organization. And in the scoping guide at level two, we had some upset in the industry with all of a sudden there was a new category of asset during the scoping phase where MSPs were lumped under ESPs, external service providers, and they were called a security protection asset. In the scoping guide itself that came out months ago, um, there's been confusion because a lot of organizations were like, all right, so if the 110 controls would apply to my MSP, is that only for the controls that they play some part in providing capabilities or services to our organization, or do all of the 110 controls apply to that MSP? There's been ongoing debate and confusion around how do we, as an organization in the defense industrial base, consider our liability and the expense of including a managed service provider in our actual assessment. And what happened in this CAP document is all of a sudden, those MSPs now have been bundled in with cloud service providers. A cloud service provider would be like Google, Amazon, Microsoft. Those are some major organizations with a lot of resources that they can dedicate to specific licensing and packages and support around just storing that controlled unclassified information. But MSPs are now being uh, bundled in to this category and there's words included in the assessment process that say things like either the MSP has to be CMMC level two themselves or potentially even fall under the category of a cloud service provider where they need to be FedRAMP moderate or equivalent. So that's the background on this. And I want to go ahead and open it as an MSP. I'll just say myself, um, Summit 7. We have many clients in the defense industrial base, and we've been aiming to get our own CMMC level two certification because we do have a government contract ourselves. And we have the ability as a contract holder to request a, a formal assessment from a C3PAO and receive a CMMC level two certification. That's very rare for an MSP. Most MSPs, those are two-man shops all the way up to 25 people. Um, they have a ton of clients. The defense industrial base clients are just a small portion of those. And they do IT services for them well, but just like they would do for any of their other companies, right? And so the idea of them going for a CMMC level two certification is going to be a very tall order. And a FedRAMP moderate certification would be something that would put them a couple of years out from being able to provide services to the defense industrial base. So I'm going to stop talking about that. And Amira, let's get your take on this first. For sure. Um, so where do I start? Uh, this 
This is a very, very controversial item in the cap. Um, and there, there's so many things wrong with it. Um, at the root, when, when we look at justification for uh, the, the security requirements that we should be expecting from external service providers, when we look at the code of federal regulations, when we look at executive orders within the federal government, uh, we see a consistent theme which says, if we put CUI out into the private sector, right, defense contractors or their supporting organizations, we will require that those private sector organizations uh, secure the CUI according to NIST Special Publication 800-171, right? And it, that's a consistent theme across many layers across the entire federal government. And the DOD itself has put out uh, regulations that say for this situation, we expect 800-171. Um, now the DOD is allowed to tell its defense contractors, we want more than that. Okay, they are allowed to do that. All, all agencies. This is all, all based on whether or not they um, process, store, or transmit controlled and classified information. Uh, right, right. Across the federal government, the expectation is if you process, store, or transmit CUI, uh, you're expected to apply 8171, which is those 110 requirements. Mm -hmm. um, the DOD, they uh, in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, they added a paragraph that said, if you use a cloud service provider to store, process, or transmit CUI, you want to make sure that that cloud service provider has uh, FedRAMP, moderate, or equivalent, right? But it does not say that that is required for any external service provider that has anything to do with, with these organizations, right? It's very specific to cloud service providers, which are, like Joy said, um, you know, they meet some definitions of, of a big cloud, right? Like AWS or Microsoft 365 um, or Salesforce, right? Uh, the, the little MSP shops don't meet those definitions. Those are external service providers, not cloud service providers. Um, so the, the other thing, if you bear with me, 800-171, the, the requirements that we are assessing under CMMC, it actually does address this. It says one of the practices in there says that, uh, if you use an external system, right, such as a cloud or an MSP, uh, you have to make sure that that cloud or that MSP meets your organizationally defined security requirements. Mm -hmm. And that's where this conversation is supposed to be held inside of those requirements that the DOD has said the assessors are supposed to review, right? Mm -hmm. Part of the, uh, the CMMC assessment guide. Um, the, the, the assessment process, this, this looks like we're adding new requirements to, to CMMC, and that's supposed to be owned by the DOD. And the, the hard part, I think, is that now they've added another layer of confusion because we have one document in the assessment process that actually conflicts, contradicts information that has been provided in the level two scoping guide, where the MSP is called a security protection asset because they provide protection for the controlled and classified information. And so, you know, what we have here is a mix of, of you know, uh, conversation around what does an MSP do in the scoping guide and then new information in the cap. And I think that one of the, the hardest thing for us to reconcile is, well, who's the authority? Which is the authority? Because the organization seeking certification, Alice and Terry, you can tell me if um, the MSP, if you have an MSP, because you may not, but a lot of these small organizations do, um, who's providing services to you, and all of a sudden they have to completely redo their 
infrastructure, the way that they handle all of their processes. They have to dedicate certain personnel just to the organizations in the defense industrial base, a um, whole bunch of added background checks. I mean, the layers of complexity are huge. How much is their cost for services going to increase to you as an end client in order for you to keep using them? Um, astronomical. I mean, I, I think it's the same same version of the conversation that we have when we talk about OSCs who have not been following NIST 800-171 when they should have. And by the time they have to get kind of where they are at, I heard a great analogy that um, it was somebody on CUI Center of Excellence that said MSPs are a consumer of external cloud services. Yeah. So it, it's, you, you can't loop this in. You can't, I mean, it, to, to think that an MSP is going to become FedRAMP is absurd because that's not possible. So that's not a thing. And I, I, my concern from an OSC perspective, reading, reading a lot of the cap, I cringe because I wonder how much of it is a misunderstanding by the authors yeah. and how much is it of a complete misinterpretation and overstep of authority. So like, like Amira said, I, we all need to kind of fall back on the whole DOD side and they need to be the ones to, to define and they have, and we need to fall on that. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to, um, in the interest of time, we're, we're going to move forward and we have a, a couple others we want to touch on real quickly, but um, you know, I also want to put out there, I think that you all would agree there does, there should be some level of cybersecurity requirement for a managed service provider. I mean, we've seen that they are, um, you know, one of the, vulnerable links in the supply chain, that if they are compromised themselves, a bad actor would have access to all of their client networks in certain regards. And so, you know, there should be some threshold for which they have a third party come in to um, review their own cybersecurity and make sure that as they provide protect protection to the defense industrial base, they themselves won't be compromised. Um, the other thing about a managed service provider that I used to say when I had my own MSP was, you know, I don't want to ask my clients to implement something in their own organization that I haven't done myself security wise, because then it helps me to understand the resourcing, the cost, the blood, sweat and tears, the, the agony of everyone being asked to do something differently, even something as simple as MFA, right? So if they're not doing it themselves, how can they expect to have a conversation of depth and weight with their clients to truly understand the implementation and what that means for the business processes that they're potentially going to be affecting. So um, we'll go ahead and move to the next one. Uh, we it, want to make sure. what, one, one last thing regarding the MSPs and the security that, that they need to implement. Mm -hmm. It really needs to be scoped to the CUI. Yes. So is the MSP protecting their client's CUI? And we need to start with the location of that CUI and then trace it to the MSP systems and make sure that those systems are secure in order to contribute to protecting the CUI. But making sure that the MSP's computers are extremely secure, completely unrelated to yeah. the client's data is not helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of confusion around what is inheritance, what is non-duplication, and what is reciprocity. In section 1.5.5, um, there's some mention of, you know, what would be required even for FedRAMP moderate um, verification. And real quick, I thought maybe that it would be helpful, Amira, if you could explain the difference between those three, why this is important, and then we'll move into some of the physical inspection requirements. For sure. So this kind of has been my specialty uh, the last year. Um, so what we have seen as assessors is the DOD and the Cyber AB are starting to um, realize that there is a problem when uh, defense contractors use external services, right? They, The defense contractors, especially if they're not trying to be secure yet, they have a tendency to put um, their CUI in places that they can't verify are, are secure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there does need to be some verification 
that those external services are secure. And the ways that we can do that are via inheritance or reciprocity, uh, or we can come in and have that, that external entity part of the assessment, right? They get assessed mm -hmm. right along with the defense contractor. The way reciprocity works, um, and, and the cap right now, this latest version of, of the cap only talks to reciprocity. It doesn't talk to inheritance or non-duplication. Um, something's gone lost. Uh, the way reciprocity works is it's kind of a badging system, right? So we don't want to see how the sauce is made. We don't want to know, you know, what was, what was looked at or how you looked at it or what you verified. We just want to see that somebody says you're good. And that's it, right? That's reciprocity. Uh, that 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 external system. Somebody said they're good, right? So an example of that would be if if somebody um, took a took an MSP and they did a CMMC uh, assessment of them and gave them a CMMC certificate, mm -hmm. right? And then we just go, okay, that they, they're certified, right? Hopefully we have reciprocity for that from CMMC to CMMC, and we just go, we just trust them, right? We don't need to look any deeper. Mm -hmm. um, the problem with reciprocity is that there's very few frameworks out there that come anywhere close to the requirements of CMMC. Uh, pretty much the, the, the frameworks are the FedRAMP, uh, you know, moderate or equivalent, um, government systems under risk management framework or CMMC itself. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And when you're trying to talk about defense contractors and their external providers, they don't have those. Right. So FedRAMP, there's a couple hundred legit cloud providers in the world that have gotten FedRAMP authorized. Right. I don't think there's a single managed service provider anywhere in the world that has FedRAMP or risk management framework or CMMC at this point. Right. Right. So we can't do reciprocity because they don't have that badge, right, uh, where it's equivalent or better to the CMMC requirements. Um, inheritance in comparison is a much more granular view. Uh, so inheritance would be taking an assessment report done by a third party assessor like my company or, or another company uh, where they actually go through the uh, functionally equivalent assessment to CMMC, right? It could be a SOC 2, but the, the key is it has to be the same scope it has to be against the same requirements, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that assessor goes through each each requirement and says, yes, I verified it. I personally made sure that this is in place, right? And they issue a report that might be 20 pages long. And at that point, the when you're doing the assessment of the defense contractor, you can take that assessment report and go line by line and say, okay, for this external entity, for this requirement, are they doing it? Okay, it says yes, right? Mm -hmm. And we check it off on our on our grid as well. Mm -hmm. So inheritance is very, very granular. Mm -hmm. Reciprocity is basically just, do they have a badge, right? Mm -hmm. Good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and inheritance is actually a great concept that we need to use for CMOC. And it, it's it's sadly been lost from this version of the the cap. Um, non duplication is another word for inheritance. It basically says don't reassess the same organization over and over and over and over again. If you've got an assessment report that says they're doing it, use that assessment report. Yeah. That's that's what non duplication means. Back to you. Thank you. And so it's just a, a crucial component. We haven't had enough. Um, elaboration on or guidance. Right now, nothing is out there other than FedRAMP moderate, and that's really for cloud service providers. 
in a nutshell, right? But it's something that we do need to get um, in writing and as part of the assessment process for the assessors to be able to look at any of those three categories to determine how can we save money, time, and not have the organization seeking certification go through a lot more cumbersome of a process than necessary, especially if, if they've already invested in selecting providers that have gone through this trouble. So Terry, I haven't had a lot of uh, conversation with you yet, but you know, one of the things that we noticed in the assessment process is that it mandated 15 different cybersecurity controls in CMMC that would have to be performed on site with a assessment team member. I just wanted to hear from the perspective of an organization being certified or requesting certification. Um, what would this mean financially, resource wise? How, how does that impact the overall picture of what you're expected to accommodate? And if we, if we had to bring an assessor at each of our sites, we have five different locations. That would dramatically increase the cost of flying time for, for physical validation of all these requirements. What's very, very odd and, and interesting is that you know, DIPCAT doesn't do this, especially for large organizations. They go to one site, right? They do an inspection or do the physical and, and they're done. They don't ask to actually look at, visit every single location. Um, I, th I think that objective, objective is, hey, th these are the requirements. Do you have something stating that you're meeting these requirements? How are, how are you stating you're doing it? Okay, well, show me how you're doing it. And, and so that, that depth and breadth of actually the assessment process increases that cost by by not only for the physical but all the requirements. Right? If I if I need to validate a, a not just one system, but I need to have to validate fifty systems, well, that increases the time. The time I have to pay the the C two P O to mm -hmm. actually do do that assessment. Which I would even argue at that point, it's not really an assessment anymore, but it becomes more of an audit. Right? At what level of, of guarantee are you st stating that you're are implementing these requirements? Mm -hmm. If DOD says DIPCAC process is sufficient, we're good, we're good with that. I don't understand why the Cyber AB would try to increase what the DOD is already accepting as, as acceptable. Yeah. Um, anything to add to that, Allison? No? Okay. So um, I know that everyone is probably saying, oh my gosh, now we're just finally hitting phase two, but here's what happened as I understand it. You might give a, a more accurate voice to this, but as the uh, team got into the actual assessment process for, for now, we're, now that we've done all of the readiness phase and everything we just talked about upfront is a tremendous amount of work for any assessor team to do with an OSC. And now they get the actual assessment phase. So you know, what I saw happen was that it's just like, we just need to have people who do assessments for a living, this kind of assessment, help the cyber AB to write this in a way that makes sense on behalf of all of the stakeholders. That's my takeaway from it. Is, is Does anyone want to expand on that part of it? <laughs> that, that, hit, that hit the nail on the head. There, there were a lot of linear problems. It does read as if a lot of it reads like that uh that group project that we all had to do in in high school or college where it's all right you do this section you do this one we'll throw it we'll copy paste it in a word doc it feels like that unfortunately um but i mean i know i know they've got to divide and conquer but um but yeah that that definitely needs to be cleaned up there are a lot of drafts uh, a lot of forms but I, I think even even more importantly a lot of the forms some are referenced as mandatory and some are recommended and in, in my opinion, as an OSC, I would rather an assessor only be given the documents that are required. And that way, as an OSC, I can see them ahead of time and know, okay, I need a plan for this and I need to have this ready. And, you know, it's, it's like walking into a doctor's office and already having your application filled out. You're saving those 10 minutes. You know, if this is the first time you've seen the form, then there's going to be a problem. Yeah. And that's the thing too is that um if these are gated forms and they're meant to be viewed by and utilized by the assessor teams only 
how can all of the consultants out there in the ecosystem, there's registered provider organizations, there's people that are not registered provider organizations that are doing a hell of a great job um, in helping an organization get ready for these assessments. And if they can't even see the forms that are going to be used to collect the data, to do the reporting, how are they going to know and, and properly prepare in advance of that? So it's a little bit crazy. Um, I also know, you know, I, I come from teams of uh, people in both my most in the role I'm in now and in the, the one previous to this full of PMPs, people that are project management professionals. And when they look at the flow of the cap and what's expected with all of the different swim lanes and deliverables, they're like, this makes no sense. I mean, PMPs are suicidal looking at this document and saying, there's no way. How can we be efficient in our resourcing and staffing and, and make this affordable to an organization seeking certification if it's not linear in any way that makes sense? Right. So a bunch of things wrong with that. Um, and then really um, carrying that into the uh, close out of the assessment. We have a lot of the same problems. Is there anything that Amira you wanted to point out about the POEM scoring? Um, it was interesting to me that we have a bunch of criteria that feels like scoping or should maybe be associated with the assessment guide itself that's thrown into the cap. What's your take on this? Uh, for sure. The um, starting in, in phase three, at, towards the end of phase two, phase three, uh, the, the cap um, gets, gets pretty confusing, to be honest. Uh, it introduces this concept called, I think, the, the limited deficiency something something program. Mm -hmm. um, which I have read about 50 times and I still don't fully understand it. Um, so this again, you know, the cyber AB, they changed their name to the cyber AB because they want to be an accreditation body for multiple federal agencies. I, I expect, right. Possibly international. Um, and yet the CMMC assessment process is uh, trying to list off DOD specific technical guidance um, in terms of, you know, which practices are acceptable to the DOD to be uh, failed versus met. Um, and this again should be referred out to the owner of the model, uh, which is the DOD in this case, um, and let them determine what, what is a, a, you know, acceptable score for the DOD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really hard uh, to digest in the format of, of being giving conflicting or additional information to what is a formal DOD document, and it's supposed to be an assessment process. So um, the final phase, closing out the poem, I didn't see any particular comments come from the group. I don't even know that you guys made it that far um, in the, yeah, so um, what the biggest thing that we wanted to talk about as a team is how important everyone's voice is in this ecosystem. So we've got this Discord group with, a, a, you know, 2000 active members is pretty substantial. And if you don't comment, if you don't have your voice heard, then we have a lot less opportunity for this to be taken very seriously by the cyber AB. Not that they're not, but we don't know yet. What we do know is that the comment period for the public will close on August 29th. We have an email address, capcomments at cyberab.org. And in the town hall on August 30th, we have been told by Matt Travis that they're going to dedicate that town hall I don't know if it's entirely or just a portion of it to addressing some of the aggregate con comments that they've been seeing come in from the public. So this is the opportunity. Um, we've walked through this with what we see as varied stakeholders. I mean, you couldn't get a more wonderful uh, representation of voices in the ecosystem. We all have different things at stake in the success of this program. I think we'd all agree we want the program to be successful. 
We are very patriotic. We absolutely um, understand the need and the desire to protect the sensitive information for our nation and protect our war fighters. So we're hopeful as a call to action that people will take this really seriously, consider the things that we put out there as some of the main things to address, add in anything else that they themselves think is important for the success of their own organization within the CMMC construct and just say something right? Get that information out there. Um, any parting words? Uh, let's, let's Terry, anything that you'd like to close out with? You know, when we first started this, um, Amir was like, we just need to start from scratch. <laughs> so, and, and I'm like, well, I, I was like, we, I think we should give it a shot and kind of go line by line and address the specific issues. And as we kept going further and further and further, it was very obvious that it just needs to be redone. Like it was, it was going to be too difficult to try to understand the content, what they were trying to do, trying to pull from so many different other references, trying to add additional information. It just made it complicated, confusing. So I, I would go back to, you know, the big, it just needs to be redone like completely. Um, yeah. Okay. Allison. I think Terry hit it on the head right there. We all should have just listened to Amira from the get-go. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. <laughs> Amira, closing comment. I, I had seen it for a, a, about a month prior to you guys. Um, kind of on the same uh, thread, the, the cap was written from the very early days as a timeline where each section was supposed to be done in order. Um, and that's really... Uh, made it almost impossible or impossible to really turn it into a good document because there's so many things that should be addressed as concepts outside of the timeline. But because we're trying to do just-in-time instructions as part of a phased approach, mm -hmm. it really makes it hard to understand the concepts, to make sure that the concepts make sense across multiple phases. Um, and it, it really needs to be just redistributed the timeline should be a timeline, and then the majority of the documents should be concepts. Good stuff. I know you put in a tremendous amount of time, all three of you, along with many others on the Kui Discord server. And on behalf of the CMMC ecosystem, I want to thank you for the amount of TLC that you've put into this, and I'm hopeful that it makes a difference. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for the invite, Joy. Thanks You're for welcome. saying this up, Joy. <laughs>